So now we have a good idea of how we can categorize different uh, animal phyla. We talked about their development, whether they're a protostome or deuterostome. We talked about their germ layers, looking at the endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, the type of digestion they have, the type of symmetry they have, if they have a coelom or not, and what type of coelom. And we're going to look at those terms a lot when we talk about the different animal phyla. Now, the organization that we're going to go through is some of the most simple and probably some of the first organisms and first animals, and we'll move all our way up to us, mammals. So first one we'll cover is phylum periphera. Periphera are our sponges. And this is an example, and there's a lot of diversity and a lot of different species of our sponges. Now, although we learned all those different terms about development and animal classification, sponges are kind of outside of it. They're odd. They don't really fit into a lot of those categories. So for example, they lack symmetry. Now, although it says no symmetry here, this is the same exact thing as saying asymmetrical. Now, some organisms might look like they could be bilateral or could be radial, uh, but a majority of them really are asymmetrical. And we kind of group them all as asymmetrical. If they happen to be symmetrical, it doesn't give them any kind of leg up. It's just because that's how the different proteins were formed. They also don't have germ layers. So they don't have an endoderm or ectoderm. We don't classify them as a triplo or a diploblast at all. And we'll talk about why in just a moment, but they, they don't even fall in that category. And because they don't have germ layers, that means they're not a triploblast. And if they're not a triploblast and you have no mesoderm, you can't have a coelom. So they are truly the most primitive of our animals. But again, they're considered an animal because they're multicellular, they are motile at some point in their life, they're getting energy. So this is why we at least consider them an animal, even though they seem so very different from the other animals that we'll look at. So as I mentioned before, you know, sponges don't have an endo or ectoderm. And really, they're not like most animals at all. And this is because sponges are incredibly simple. They don't have that much to them. So they're really made up of two major chemicals uh, or major structures. The first one is spongin. You can probably guess where it got its name. Um, spongin is the actual softness of a sponge. It's that kind of grippy stuff that you can hold on to and squeeze. That spongin is not a cell. Spongin is a protein that is released by cells that are within the sponge that we'll talk about in a second. So spongin is very similar to our hair or our nails. Our hair and nails aren't alive. They're not really cells. It's keratin. It's a protein that our body makes. So same thing with sponges. Actually, the majority of a sponge is spongin, which is a protein. Uh, there's actually very few, well, relatively very few cells. There's still thousands, if not millions of cells, but the spongin, the actual structure of a sponge, is actually just all proteins. Within this spongin are molecules that are called spicules. And you can kind of see it in this picture, but they almost look like playing jacks. Um, and these spicules can be made out of two different substances. This one that you're seeing in this picture, uh, this one's made of silica. We actually have what are referred to as silica sponges, where they're only made of this silica compound, and they actually don't have spongin in them. The other thing they can be made out of is calcium carbonate. And I have calcium carbonate in red because we're going to talk about it again when talking about the evolution of our next phyla. So kind of commit that to memory, that these spicules can be either silica or calcium carbonate. Both of those are minerals. Both of those are taken out of the water column and then created from the cells within our sponges. Now these spicules have a couple of different functions. Now when you're looking at a sponge like this, you don't really see the spicules. The spicules are microscopic. One of them is as a defense mechanism. You know, if I am some fish biting this sponge and it ends up being really hard and essentially a whole bunch of glass in it, I'm not going to want to eat it anymore. 
Also, spongin is a very soft material, whereas spicules, whether they're silica or calcium carbonate, are a very hard and sturdy structure. So it kind of helps give structure to the sponge body. Now again, all of these things are non-living things. However, within all of these structures, there are living cells of this sponge. So I'm gonna actually go down to coanocytes first, uh, and then I'll come back and talk about these other two. So I keep saying there's living parts of this sponge. And the living parts of the sponge are referred to as the coanocytes. We talked about these before when we were talking about the origin of animals in general, how we went from protists to animals. Remember the protists that was kind of a precursor were coanoflagellates. So we think that these coanoflagellates just started hanging out with each other and for some reason, when there's a lot of them together, they started releasing spongin or making spicules and, and add a couple million years and bam, you've got a sponge. So these coanocytes are kind of everywhere within the sponge. Now what their job is as a cell of this sponge is this flagella helps in water movement. The sponges are not going out and consuming things. They do consume things, but they're not catching them. They don't have tentacles to grab things and bring them in. They don't have arms or legs. They're, the little holes don't open and close. Instead, it's the coanocytes. And their flagella actually wave back and forth and give them the ability to create a water current in the sponge. So what will happen is on the outside of this sponge throughout the entire body, there's tons of little holes called ostea uh, or osteum. Osteum for singular, ostea plural. And in this diagram, you can kind of see those, these individual holes. Inside of those holes is all this spongin and the coanocytes are lining them and they're beating their flagella back and forth and it's helping to suck in water through these ostea. Then you have all these coanocytes all up and down this sponge and lining the osculum. And again, all these coanocytes beating their flagella back and forth. And what happens is water is going to come in through the sides and then it's actually going to get pushed through the sponge and then out the top uh, pore or the top opening called the osculum. And essentially you're just generating a water current. Now, not only are these coanocytes creating this water current, but when they're doing that, um, this por portion of the coanocyte is actually going to catch food. And so it's filtering that water. That's the why we need that water moving is because these coanocytes are filtering the water. They're grabbing out, you know, maybe algae or bacteria or some sort of uh, microplankton in order to eat it. And that's pretty much a sponge. Like it, it's not really that complex. And again, a lot different than we saw from uh, our other species. So what I wanna do here is pause. There's a YouTube video that um, is linked here and it's a pretty long YouTube video, but you can start it at four minutes and 21 seconds. And I want you to watch it for a couple minutes. There's a researcher who is uh, inserting this fluorescent chemical around sponges and you can actually see the water filtration of these sponges which is really cool so go ahead and pause here uh, up on youtube there should be a box popping up right above me and pause this video then go click that link and watch that video for about two to three minutes it'll kind of be obvious where it's kind of done uh, you can keep watching more of it but the most important part is at 421 and watch it for two to three minutes so go ahead and pause here, watch this video, and then once you're finished watching that video, come back to this lecture. Okay, so you've watched the video and it's so cool, like seeing that fluorescent green neon-y paint stuff going through that sponge and actually incredibly quickly. Uh, when I first saw that video, I was incredibly surprised at how fast that water movement was. But again, he was spraying it, you know, along the bottom. And then all of these ostea and all of the coanocytes inside of them were pushing in that water and filtering if there was any plankton or anything in them. 
So that's it for sponges. Again, they're kind of weird in the sense that, you know, they don't have germ layers, they don't have anything. They're kind of this transition organism between our protist origins and the animal world. So the next one up that we're gonna talk about that has a little bit more order to it is phylum cnidaria. And sometimes you're gonna hear me refer to these. Let me get my pen out. So the phylum name is cnidaria, but you might hear me say, or you might see on a test, the word cnidarians. This is just referring to all organisms in the phylum cnidaria. Now I mentioned this the other class, that phylum cnidaria has both our jellyfish, but also things like sea anemones. Sea anemones are directly related. They're in the same phylum and have a lot of the same characteristics. So if you're taking a look at our jellyfish, and we talked about this when we were first talking about our different characteristics of animals, their symmetry. Now they do have a left and right, but they actually have a million directions. They're referred to as radially symmetrical because they're circular. I could cut them in half this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. You can cut them in half a million different ways because they're circular. Remember, with radial symmetry, this means they can detect their environment from all regions, but it comes at a downside. They're typically slower moving. If you recall that our cnidarians were the only organisms that were diploblastic. Diplo, remember that di, meaning two. So they have two different germ layers. They have the endoderm that's going to line, and actually in this image, that's this yellow here. They're going to line the internal gastrovascular tract, whereas the ectoderm, ecto meaning outside, but they lack a mesoderm. We don't see that in our cnidarians. Their digestion, we talked about them as an example as well. They have incomplete digestion. They only have one opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus. And this is true of both the jellyfish and the sea anemones. So it's all organisms within this phylum that share that characteristic. This diagram is showing both a sea anemone and a jellyfish. And again, only one opening in both of them. It's situated a little differently, but still only one opening. Now something else unique about this phylum uh, is that we actually have two different forms. And that kind of makes sense. You know, jellyfish is very different than a sea anemone. So one form is referred to as the polyp. A polyp is a sessile organism. Sessile means, I totally apologize for this text. Sessile means something that does not move. Yes, a sea anemone might move back and forth in the water current and it can move its tentacles a little bit, but it stays still. Once it's attached to a rock, it's not moving. Corals, such as a coral reef, those are also um, a type of sea anemone. But once they land, so they land as a larvae, they stay there and they don't move. On the other hand, though, we have jellyfish. Jellyfish are referred to as a medusa or the medusa form. Uh, Medusa, think of, I don't know if she was Greek or Roman or what lore she's from, but she was like the crazy snake head lady, right? Has a head, but has all these snakes coming out as her hair. Well, that's essentially what a jellyfish looks like. This is the mobile, or sometimes you will see it spelled, and technically it's a different word, but you'll see mobile or motile. This just means moving. So this is a free moving or free uh, swimming form. And so we see both forms within this phylum. Uh, it really just depends on what class we are looking at. One last characteristic about them that you're probably uh, familiar with is the fact that they stink. Um, and, and this isn't just jellyfish. Sea anemones sting as well. Coral can sting as well. Typically coral though are so small that you don't feel it, but they're also stinging. And it's actually really interesting and fascinating how they sting. So on the tentacles, whether it's the tentacle of an anemone, of a coral, or the tentacles of a jellyfish, they have specialized cells within those tentacles. And those specialized cells are called something uh, called a nidocyte. 
So you kind of have that CN again, um, but a NIDO site. In this image, this is a close up of a tentacle. It's not all cytes. it's only these. And you'll see a specialized structure on them. Those are the cytes. Now that specialized structure you're seeing uh, is this trigger hair. And essentially how a trigger hair works is that if something brushes past that trigger and bends it, so if you were to run your finger along the tentacle, you would be uh, bending these triggers, it's going to trigger that cell. It's actually very similar to how a venous flytrap works. If you look at a venous flytrap, you see all these little hairs. The flytrap doesn't close unless those hairs are triggered. So that cytocyte gets triggered, and what's going to happen is it's going to release a part of its, uh, or one of its organelles, an organelle called a pneumatocyst. So here's that entire cytocyte cell. And this orange structure is the nematocyst. And the nematocyst will um, spring out once it's been triggered. And essentially, it wraps around you. Uh, now, very molecular scale. But it's wrapping around its prey, or it's latching onto its prey, or it's touching the prey, and it releases venom. So that stinging sensation that you feel if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish isn't because it was rough or anything like that, that's actually feeling the venom of that jellyfish. Um, for us, well, depending on the jellyfish, it, it just has a stinging sensation. For other species of jellyfish, that can actually kill you. The venom is so potent, especially out in like Australia. You really should not swim in Australia. There's way too many things that can kill you uh, in those waters. Now this word nematocyst, this might seem similar, and this is where biology sucks sometimes. <laughs> the way you've seen this, so new matocysts. This is the word we've already learned. We learned this in our plant unit, at plant, algae, protists, etc. This type of nematocyst was from our brown algae. Those were the little air pockets or the air bladders that help keep kelp afloat. So same word, uh, but spelled differently. So if you're like, I know this word, yes, you do, but uh, it was spelled differently and referred to something else. So again, all of the tentacles, no matter the exact species, have these nidocytes. They have a trigger hair that when something brushes past them, it's going to trigger the nematocyst to release. That nematocyst is going to wrap around it or touch it or it's going to do something and it's going to release venom um, on its prey. Now, if this is a smaller prey item, it could actually kill the prey item and the jellyfish or the sea anemone has food. Or if it's a human and we are much bigger than that venom and that jellyfish, it might not really affect us that much. So just like before, I'm going to have you pause and I want you to go watch this YouTube video. This video is of some researchers down in Australia who are actually looking um, through a high speed camera at the reaction of these nidocytes and nematocysts. It's really, really fascinating um, and really interesting to kind of see these in action. Also, they are hiring uh, for grad students uh, in their lab. So if it's something that interests you and you want to move to Australia, you have the opportunity. So go ahead and pause this video, click on the link of the video popping up, go watch that video, and then come back here.